It is wonderful to be with you this morning, this third Sunday in Easter, as we continue to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. As I've been thinking about this story of the two walking on the road to Emmaus, I realized something, and you may say, duh, of course, but you can only know what you know. Unless someone has come up with an amazing machine that can tell the future perfectly, you can only know what you know based on the experiences that you've had, on the information that you have, on what has been revealed to you in your life. The same is true about these two walking on the road to Emmaus. They only know what they know. Their perspective is limited to what they've experienced so far. At camp, one of my favorite um, experiences that we do, or one of my favorite kind of lessons, is this book called Zoom. At the beginning of the book is a picture that is zoomed all the way in. The last page of the book shows the earth, really small. And in between, is a whole big story. We're gonna take a few minutes and we're gonna look at that story because as a good camp person, I just happen to have a copy here laminated in pieces. <laughs> if there's any kids or confirmation students that could help me just kind of pass these out, that would be really helpful. Anyone wanna come help? You can just kind of give, you don't have to give one to everyone, maybe one per row, just give everybody a chance to take a picture. So just take one, it's gonna be like one per few people, but make sure you can at least see one close to you. And take a look at that with those around you and take just a minute, literally, and kind of talk about what you think might be happening in that picture. What do you think is going on? Do you have more? get one? There's more over here. <laughs> Come in. A couple over here. Did you guys get one? You've got one down there. There you go. So based on your picture, you only know what you know based on what you see. At camp, we usually take them and line them all up so we can take a big look at the whole picture and realize that this very first piece right here is actually the top of a rooster. Who has a rooster in their picture? Nope, there's a rooster right there. There's some more of the rooster. And as you zoom out, you realize that the first half of the pictures are actually a billboard on the side of a bus. And that the bus then is driving through a city, a city that is um, uh, in a picture, I believe. The city's in the picture. And that really it's all sitting on an island that a plane dropped off in the middle of the ocean that is then being zoomed out to the earth. If there's anyone that wants to put it together afterwards, it's really fun to see. But you only know what you know. So if we were to lay this story out from rooster to earth on the floor, and we picked up one of those cards in the middle, we'd realize that that's where we find our two friends on the road to Emmaus, and also where we find ourselves in our life, because we can only know what we know. As we read through the gospel, which we started at the beginning and kept going through, 
Um, there's a several things that really stuck out to me that I think are noteworthy, that we could stop and think about for a few minutes that as we apply their journey, their road to ours. First of all, I think it's good to note that they were walking seven miles. I was trying to think about the last time I walked seven miles at one time, and it was when we did my last, I did my last half marathon, and um, my daughter turned eight months old, that, nine months old that day. It was a terrible idea. Who thought that that was a good plan? But um, when we walked that seven miles, I had really comfortable shoes. I had snacks. We had a jogging stroller. There was people cheering on the side of the road. I feel like that's not what their experience was. Seven miles is a long way, and as they're walking and talking, Jesus comes alongside them. He joins their journey as just someone that was going to walk alongside them. When he asked them a question, they stood still and they were sad. How many times on your journey have you found a moment where you just needed to stand still and be sad? My girls are four and a half and two, two, four and two and a half, sorry. Um, and we have a lot of moments where we have to stand still and be sad. There's a lot of big emotions going around in my house right now, and we spend some times where we just sit still and we're sad. I don't try to make it better. We don't try to give them perspective. I don't try to, you know, share all of the big context of why they're feeling that way. We just sit still and are sad. And Jesus lets us do that on our journey as well, just as he did with the two on the road to Emmaus. He walked alongside them. He accompanied them. He was with them where they were. And then they did a lot of talking. We're going to skip down to the end. As they were done and they had approached the, the house, Jesus was ready to go on, and the two said, wait, no, stay with us. Come and join us. It is almost the end of the day. In this moment of hospitality, they welcomed a stranger that they had barely knew. They'd walked for some miles. But they welcomed him in, gave him, meal, gave him a meal. And it was in the midst of that meal where Jesus took the bread, he blessed it, broke it, and gave it to them. Did that sound familiar at all? We heard that before. That that's when their eyes were opened and they recognized who they had been with. That it was this invitation uh, an act of hospitality, and in the breaking of the bread, in this communal meal together that Jesus is revealed. And then he disappears. And then they turn around, they just, the two, stand up, turn around, and head back down the road. Their journey wasn't finished. They turned around and went back those seven miles to go and find Jesus' disciples and to tell them what had happened. I think this is a really cool metaphor for those of us who are standing in our life, in our community, in our families, knowing only what we know, and saying, I wonder what's next. I feel like I could use some more information. And that's where this moment of sharing the meal together is so powerful. I grew up going to camp. It was a tradition that I got to do every single summer. And I also attended church every week. So the two experiences of being part of a faith community and then having this experience at camp were so interwoven for me as a kid. Because when I got to go to camp, faith was this lived experience. It tasted like cookies and lemonade on a Sunday. It smelled like the forest when you wake up in the morning and it's dew and Oregon and ferns and that has a smell to it. It was playing. It was falling down and hurting your ankle. It was living in a cabin with people that I didn't know. It was all of those things of having adults, mentors. It was watching leaders work who put it all together and made it happen. And then I took that lived experience of eating and playing and laughing and running around back to those everyday experiences in church, and it made it come alive for me. We have those lived experiences here in congregational life of the times where you can eat together, where you rub elbows at a table, and you get a chance to be together. 
And we're kind of coming back to those moments, aren't we, after a few years apart. But those lived experiences are where Jesus meets us. And we have this lived experience when we experience the sacraments. How many times a day do you bump into water? How many times do you use water a day? A lot, right? Our baptism is water. How many times do you eat something or drink something, put something in your mouth and chew it? Quite a few. Reminds us of the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, of when Jesus comes to us, he makes himself known to us in those lived experiences. Those lived experiences then are what help us on our journeys to know more of what we know or to at least have the hope and the comfort that God is walking along with us on our journeys. That the next step, though we can't see it, God knows and will be revealed to us when it's time. I think the beauty of this story and the way that it can apply to all of us is that we're in it together. That no matter what the hope is or what the um, information is that you're hoping to get next in your life as a community, as a family, as an individual, that we do this work together. Our hope is always that camp isn't seen just as something where kids go in the summer, but that we can be a reminder for all people of what living the experience is like. And how can we accompany you and you accompany us in the process and in the understanding of knowing more of who God is and where we are on our journeys? Our invitation is always for you to come to camp because it's fun. Because it's fun to meet Jesus in cookies and lemonade and in archery and in the smell of the ferns. But also because it's a great reminder to bring back to the places where you do your daily work that God is among us in the tangible, in the living, in the shared experiences. As I was thinking this week and thinking of you all and getting a chance to be part of your worship this morning, you're in a lot of transition as a community, in a a lot of a time of discernment, and a lot of figuring out what's next. And know that we pray for you at camp and that we are excited to be part of your journey. But the prayer that kept coming to mind that I want to close our time in this morning is the Lutheran prayer of good courage. And that this could be all of our prayers, no matter where we are in the midst of transition. But this morning, I pray especially for you. Let's pray. Lord God, you have called your servants to ventures of which we cannot see the ending by paths yet untrodden, through perils unknown. Give us faith to go out with good courage, not knowing where we go, but only that your hand is leading us and your love is supporting us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.